So good evening and welcome. My name is Sue Cumming and I'm an independent facilitator and I'm pleased to be here with you this evening to facilitate the discussion and to lead us through the presentation. Uh, this is an important uh, night to be able to hear about the work that's happening on the climate change action strategy for the city of Hamilton. There are two presentations and then we'll have some good time for discussion. So we know that there will be some additional people coming in as we as we start. And just again a reminder, if you've joined us this evening evening by telephone. We have just recently learned that through WebEx there can be a charge to you if you've used one of the global numbers. So we wanted to make sure that anyone who's joined us by phone, and I see there may be one or two, that you were able to use the local Hamilton toll-free number. That is the number that's shown the 1905 540 881 number. So you might need to hang up on us and then come back in. We apologize for that. We just want to make sure that no one incurs any charges for your participation this evening. So as I noted, tonight is about the Hamilton Climate Change Action Strategy. And we'd like to start um, through, by acknowledging the land acknowledgement. If I could have the next slide, please. So the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land and so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. Next, please. So some quick introductions. Again, thank you for attending this virtual public information session. So we have tonight several presenters. We have Christine Newbold, who is a manager of sustainable communities, and she'll be presenting particularly on the energy emissions plan. And then we have Tre Trevor Imahoff, who's a senior project manager, air quality and climate change. He's with public health, and he'll be looking at that adaptation plan primarily. And Andrea McDowell. Andrea is on by phone this evening, and she'll be hoping to answer some questions questions that may come up in our discussion and she's a project manager also with air quality and climate change public health and then there's my name there Sue Cumming Cumming and Company and again I'm very pleased to be here with you this evening so to have got to the meeting you would have gone on to the Hamilton Engage Hamilton website I just want to remind you that at any point uh, following the meeting there continues to be good information on the site at engagehamilton.ca CEEP and for the climate change impact adaptation for the climate dash change dash adaptation. I know those are well known. It's just really important that, uh, that you have a chance to go back to the site for further information. Next, please. So the purpose of tonight's meeting is fairly, oops, one bat, one more, please, if we could go back. It just went too quickly. Purpose, great. So the purpose is really to present to you on the two really important pieces of work that the city has been doing um, to move forward on the implementation. The first is to present to you the Hamilton's draft community energy and emissions plan, and that's referred to as CEEP. We'll try to refer to it in its full name, but if you hear a CEEP, that does relate to the community energy and emissions plan. The second is to present to you the climate adapt climate change impact impact adaptation plan and that's the city has shortened up to CCIAP um, and importantly again the climate change impact adaptation plan. So we'll have two presentations with some key information on these plans and status of where the city's at and then we'd like to be able to receive your feedback and answer questions and certainly have some discussion. As part of the presentation registration for the meeting, there was an opportunity to provide some advanced questions. We do have quite a number, so I will be reading those out during our Q&A to make sure that we capture them all. Tonight is really important that we have an opportunity for staff to hear your comments, your ideas, suggestions, and feedback, and they'll be considering those in the refining of both of the documents. We will be recording, as you noted when I started the beginning, the meeting so that the presentation portion and the presentation slides 
can it be available on the Engage Hamilton pages so that anyone who missed the meeting or wanted to go back to it could in fact uh, see that information. Next please. So how do you to participate? There are a couple of ways. Uh, we wanted to give you a good presentation. It may be a little longer than, than you might have thought otherwise, about 15, 20 minutes for each of the plans, but during which, or at the end of which, we're gonna ask you some questions. So we're going to use Menti or Menti Meter, and we'll walk you through how you can very easily go on to, uh, to lead through the questions. And we'll walk through that with you when we get to the questions to make sure it's really easy. And the second key way to participate is at any point, if you can keep going to the next slide, please. At any point during our meeting, starting even now, you can go to the Q&A and you'll see there's a diagram here on the slide and you will see at the bottom, it should be on the right hand side of your screen at the bottom, Q&A. If you click on that, it'll take you to a box where you can type in questions and comments. I would ask if you could direct them to everyone, it would say to send to all as opposed to send privately. And that's a really good place for you to put any comments or questions that you have. You don't have to wait until we conclude the presentation, you can do that at any point in time. After the presentations are concluded, I will go to that and I will read them aloud. So I will read them aloud to everyone so everyone can see what the comments or hear what the comments are. And I won't read your names, but certainly it's important to be able to read those out to the team verbatim. And where they can be answered this evening, they will be, uh, but they will be all put into a feedback report. It's really important to have all of the comments um, put into the feedback report. And we'll try to get to as many as we can tonight, time permitting. Again, a third way is after the meeting tonight, a short survey will be made available to you. And that short survey is for participants at, of tonight's meeting. And it will ask you a few more detailed questions around some of the things around implementation. And if you could get that back to staff as soon as possible, that would be so appreciative. We know that everyone's busy. That would be very helpful to be able to add a few more details and comments for the group. So you may ask tonight how many people are participating. We have 48 people at this point who have joined us. We have 48 connections that may be more more than one or two people at um, each of those, but we know we've got 48 connections. And then we have your core team here who are presenting and responding to questions. So we'll walk through this hopefully very carefully and we really look forward to your input and, uh, and constructive ideas. So at this point, I'd like to turn over to Trevor Imhoff, who is going to give you an overview of the presentation outline, the context, and then lead right into this. So Trevor, to you, please. Great, thank you so much, Sue, and welcome everyone. I'm extremely excited uh, tonight to present Hamilton's Climate Change Action Strategy. And so just a, a quick context before I hand it over to Christine for the specific actions related to the Community Energy and Emissions Plan. Hamilton City Council did declare a climate change emergency in 2019. We joined many other municipalities around Canada and around the world, including the federal government of Canada on declaring a climate change uh, emergency and reaffirming the city's commitment to taking accelerated climate change action. That same year and based on council's motion and direction, city staff formed a multi-departmental climate change task force using the most up-to-date information we created nine overarching goals and 51 areas of focus for climate mitigation and adaptation. This was an important foundational document that directed every city department to start taking action on climate change. And some important successes uh, cr were created through that report and, com and completed, including Hamilton's corporate green fleet strategy, which provided uh, and approved $2.4 million in capital uh, expenditures to convert 89 internal combustion vehicles to battery all electric, as well as our corporate energy and updating our corporate energy and sustainability policy. It also provided direction for city staff to complete a community-wide and detailed community energy and emissions plan, as well as the completion of a risk and vulnerability assessment to climate change, which is being used to form and help to create Hamilton's climate change impact adaptation plan. And so these two respective plans now form Hamilton's next evolution for Hamilton's climate change action strategy. Next slide, please. Before we get into the specific actions, I just wanted to recap on the terminology of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. When we say climate mitigation, we are referring to actions that reduce the release of greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. So think about the reduction of gasoline and diesel in our transportation sector, the reduction of natural gas and other fossil fuels for space heating, for example. When we say climate adaptation, 
we're talking about the local actions that we can help to better manage, adapt, and recover from the impacts associated with climate change, including extreme weather events such as flooding, extreme heat, and other impacts associated with climate change, which will be further discussed in the Climate Change Impact Adaptation Plan, uh, which my colleague Andrea over the phone will be presenting on. So before we get into that, uh, it's my pleasure to hand it over to my colleague, Christine Newbold, to present the Community Energy and Emissions Plan. Christine. Thank you, Trevor, and good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to present this uh, draft community and energy and emissions plan to you. And uh, there is a lot of detail in the plan and which I could not possibly cover tonight. So um, feel free to use the Q and a for for questions. If you have them um, as we go through the slides on the community energy and emissions plan. So, an energy and emissions plan is a long term plan to meet Hamilton's future energy needs while improving energy efficiency, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and fostering local sustainable and community sustainable and community supported energy solutions. The plan addresses every aspect of citywide uh, energy use and GHG emissions from homes to transportation, um, buildings to waste, and it's our pathway to net zero emissions by. 2050. Development of this plan began in the spring of 2020 with the creation of a vision and principles to guide the development of the plan. Both the vision and principles speak to the need for a, a, a resilient energy system as we adapt to a changing climate. And it spe they also speak to opportunities that moves us towards a low, low carbon future and the economic prosperity that is that that can bring. Also, the vision and principles recognize the need for an equitable energy transition, and it builds on the strengths of the community and the current and past actions to decarbonize. The plan has been developed through a series of phases, and we are nearing the end of the process. We are uh, at stage five now with a draft plan and moving towards final plan adoption in August. Earlier phases of the project were focused on technical modeling of emissions, both existing emissions and projected future emissions, and intensifying or identifying appropriate targets and actions that, if implemented, would take us to that net zero emissions by 2050. The modeling of those targets and associated actions identified our net zero scenario on which the actions presented in this plan are based. A uh, quick note about engagement. Um, this uh, plan has been developed with extensive stakeholder e engagement from uh, the items identified on the slide. We've had a stakeholder advisory committee, interdepartmental city project teams that have met at key points in, in the in the plan process, the plan development process, um, and provided input and advice. Uh, we've had many one on one interviews with stakeholders, businesses, organizations, and individuals. Public surveys and virtual public information sessions were part of the engagement, as well as our HQ virtual engagement. Um, and internal and external committee presentations have been given to many organizations over the last two and a half years. Tonight, we have our final uh, public consultation um, through this PIC and then the engage Hamilton uh, items that uh, we mentioned earlier. Okay, so looking at this graph, it's the only real technical graph I'm going to put in in the presentation. Um, this sl slide shows the situation for Hamilton's greenhouse gases in 2016, which is on the left hand side, our baseline year. Uh, we are estimated to mid 8.7 megatons of carbon. So we do refer to that as our baseline. And if we continue as we are as as business as usual, as business as planned, we will move to the right side of the graph in 2050, emitting 9.6 megatons by 2050. Now you see that there is a breakdown in these these different colored bars indicating uh, the the source of the our emissions with the first big purple one here identified for us to start as industrial emissions. It does dominate our profile. But transportation in yellow and buildings in this blue and green combined is also very significant. The other elements on the grass graph, the other sources, and they're indicated um, in very small little bars to the side here. Um, those are, are 
other sources of emissions. And visually, this graph is very important because it indicates their relative contribution towards community emissions. It doesn't mean they're not important. It just means compared to these others, um, they're relatively small. However, if we were to take industry out, they become greater in importance um, visually and uh, in terms of reductions required. Moving on to actions, um, with the understanding of what our major contributions to greenhouse gases in Hamilton are, and knowing that we're nowhere close to uh, a net zero um, goal, we have identified actions that have to be taken to reduce Hamilton's greenhouse gases. The actions and targets were based on best practices from other jurisdiction, jurisdictions, um, consultant uh, feedback and recommendations to us, public input. By, by surveys and open house feedback, stakeholder advisory committee and staff advisory committees feedback, as well as um, um, general conversations and through other one-on-one -on -one engagements and discussion, discussion of actions. So in total, we, we modeled up to 30 targets which were, which, um, on which the actions that we've developed were based. Based on the modeling, we developed a series of specific actions that community could take uh, to move forward on net zero. And those actions are or buckets of actions are identified in this um, slide as low carbon transformations. Now, actions in, in the plan are for both the city as a corporation to take the lead on, as well as for um, our general broader community to take the lead on as well. So I'm going to go through each of the transformations and on each slide, you will see that we have a lead item identified on this far right side, which includes um, uh, the city of Hamilton logo. So meaning that that action, um, that city of Hamilton has a lead responsibility there. And then the grouping of people represents the community. So sometimes actions will be led by the city and sometimes it's um, members of our community, community businesses or institutions, or um, there's roles for other element, other groups in the city to take the lead on, on actions. So our first transformation is innovating our industry. So by far, uh, industry is our biggest challenge, but we have been seeing some momentum in emissions reductions already. And the steel industry is planning to decarbonize and recent announcements from uh, AMD and federal and provincial announcements on their support towards switching steel production to cleaner technologies are very promising. And there's also major potential for industrial process efficiencies across all industries. So the implementation actions that we've identified here um, that will help us get to net zero include the establishment of net zero industrial working groups um, and the establishment of a clean tech accelerator to really help industry um, get the information and connect them with technology to be able to move forward on uh, the reduce, reducing greenhouse gases. Um, identified here is also an element of training, industrial training and retraining programs are, is going to be very important as we move forward in our low carbon transmit transition, uh, because we do need to scale up a workforce that's going to be able to work in, in the technologies required um, for reaching um, low carbon and net zero. Second transformation is about transforming our buildings. Retrofits are a major component of transforming our buildings. They're going to be expensive and are going to require a lot of market innovation and the challenge will be to scale up. Uh, retrofits are critical, but improvements to new building standards are also important to be put into place to avoid the need to retrofit down, uh, down the road. So our actions in the plan in, include the development of new citywide green development guidelines and standards for, and then the development of mass deep energy retrofit programs for residential. And uh, that can be uh, transitioned over to a commercial program as well. That action on that, that action or, or progress on that action is well underway already. Also, it's important to, um, to ramp up that sustainable building training again. So again, um, retraining a labor force to work in building retrofits and uh, those related, um, related jobs. The third transformation is changing how we move. 
and that's how we move both people and goods. So decarbonizing vehicles is a key opportunity for emissions reductions. And certainly the increased focus on moving people and goods with electric vehicles is front and center. However, transit and active transportation do provide opportunities to reduce the number of trips and uh, number of auto trips and the fuel use of all types. So avoiding the need for new electricity generation and providing those co-benefits uh, such as healthy lifestyles and air quality improvements. So the priority first is given to reducing um, our trips or the VKT, vehicle kilometers traveled, um, and then switching those trips that remain to low carbon methods being um, electric vehicles or other low carbon vehicles. Actions in the plan include the expansion of and, con and connection of active transportation networks and expanded e-mobility services, as well as the decarbonization of transit and fleets, um, which will be critical while the city has been moving forward with, with that through its green fleet strategy. Private fleets may not be as far along, so we are recommending a commercial fleet decarbonization working group, again, to connect um, the goods movement sector together and share information and, and connect them to technology. Again, noting down at number 12, more training is going to be needed on, on uh, in the labor force to support that transition to electric vehicles. Fourth transformation is revolutionizing renewables. An abundance of renewable energy is vital to decarbonizing our community and there's momentum in the community already. So we have momentum in our city with our existing district energy systems, which are operated by Hamilton Community Enterprises, and those present a valuable opportunity in the community for expansion of those existing systems or establishment of new district energy systems in other areas of the city. The city also has experience in uh, organics conversion to biogas and renewable natural gas should be leveraged. And those actions are identified over in, in the action table there. Also, the use of hydrogen, specifically green hydrogen, will be a key uh, element of decarbonizing in the steel sector and its application um, to other uses uh, will become apparent as, as that, that fuel source um, develops. So the actions in the in the plan focus on a local energy supply and the development of local energy generation facilities, including solar energy installations and expanded anaerobic digestion facilities and expansion of the district energy systems. And there's a specific action uh, to advance Hamilton as a potential hydrogen hub, and that's already being advanced in conjunction with the city's economic development action plan. And the fifth and final low carbon transformation we've called growing green and growing green is not just about growing our green infrastructure in terms of our, our urban tree canopy and our natural areas, but it's about how we grow as a community, um, both physically um, and how we grow and, and develop our cities. So on the sequest sequestration side of this transformation, the greenhouse gas reductions are small. Um, but every town ton does count um, and and as we develop our urban tree canopy and support our, our forests and natural areas, there's very there's quite a few important co benefits that that we achieve as well. So improve physical and mental health of residents um, and uh, uh, air quality as well. So, looking over at the implementation actions, um, we do have a tree planting target within our plan uh, as well as. Uh, uh, actions that require the integration of our community energy and climate action policy directions into our secondary planning work and then our uh, overall policy documents that address how Hamilton should grow and develop um, should also be reviewed periodically and updated with uh, our most as, as our climate action proceeds and this plan is implemented uh, with, with uh, the policies to support continued decarbonization. So I'm going to leave it at that for now, and we're going to do a quick live poll. Great. Um, so it's, thank you, you very much, Christine. So at, at this point, what we'd like you to do, if you can, is to go to www.menti.com. So if you can do that on your smartphone, then that would pull up the code. If you can't go there because you're using your computer screen, 
you can also, when the question comes up, this is a question, you can put in your answer into the Q&A. So if you go to www.menti.com, you'll see where it prompts you for a code. And that code is here on the screen, 12009750. And the question will be there and you can actually put in your answer. So the question we're asking you is what theme or action from the draft community and emissions plan were you most excited to hear about? I see someone wrote in the Q&A that they're excited to hear about co-op neighborhood. Generation, sorry, co-op neighborhood generation. We'll be very supportive of this. That's great. So we're just doing a tally, I think, on the, uh, there we go. So now we can see that some of the answers that are coming up. We've got growing green, building energy codes, the HERO program. focus on district energy sources. So we'll be able to put all of these up and be able to also put those into the feedback report for you. So I'm just gonna give one another minute for people to put our yeah, their ideas in and there's always opportunities to uh, um, continue to add to this yeah. table if you want to submit a comment. Right. Um, Great, and uh, someone's indicated here in the chat that they really like the idea of the work that's happening with respect to steel, the steel companies. Someone's also put that they like regarding low carbon transmission on the buildings. And I know I'll read these comments out more fully later. Excited to hear about co-op neighborhood generations. Be very supportive of this. Are you able to scroll down a little bit so we can see the ones that are hidden from us on the screen? I am not, Sue. That's okay then. So we, we'll make sure that we capture oh. all of these in the feedback report, but some, there we go, so maybe some really interesting ideas. Someone writes, all of them are important. Local solar generation, supporting the next grid, dealing with industrial emissions, that's, that's noted a couple of times. The HERO program. And I know, Christine, while we were looking mm -hmm. to have people add a few more things, there was a, a question about what is the Canadian Colleges for Resilient Recovery? And is that something that costs money? I think that was referenced on one of the earlier, one of the first or second actions. Right. Um, Trevor, you have, you have a good um, experience with that. Yeah, thanks, Christine, and thanks for the question. Um, so the Canadian Colleges for Resilient Recovery um, is, uh, is a program being developed um, by, I believe, all of the colleges across Ontario. And so this would have been in consultation with our local college, uh, Mohawk College, um, in, in particular, uh, in consultation with the Centre for Climate Change Management, and uh, very much so uh, Mohawk College wanting to uh, work with all of the other colleges across Ontario to develop the curriculum for uh, the low carbon and the net zero transition. Uh, in particular, as Christine mentioned, relating to building retrofits, uh, looking at uh, renewable energy, as well as uh, industrial retraining and, and training programs as well as EV mechanic training. As far as cost, um, I'm unaware of what the costs are. I'm sure there are costs um, being generated, uh, but those costs would be uh, not on uh, the city or, or the taxpayers. It would be the colleges investing in those program development. Uh, and then of course, um, charging uh, a certain uh, administration fee to, to, attend those uh, to attend those classes. Great. Trevor, thank you. So I think we've closed the poll. I did want to add there's um, one individual, another person wrote from the, the Q&A chat that they felt, sorry, I just lost it, stakeholder involvement. Good work done. Thank you. So that these are important references. And I know there's lots of questions in the Q&A, which we're going to come to at the end of both presentations. So Trevor, at this point, I think we're now going to go to the climate change impact adaptation plan. So Christine's going to put back the presentation. Great, thank you, Sue. And I'll just double check to make sure Andrea is able to speak through her phone. Andrea, are you able to now take it from here and present the climate change impact adaptation plan to us? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. All right, here we go. Um, 
Because I'm on the phone and I can't see the slides, I'll be doing a little bit of double checking on each slide just to make sure that I'm talking about the same thing that you all are looking at. Okay, so should still be on the title slide. So um, as was mentioned, adaptation is about how we can uh, equip our communities, um, residents and businesses to be more resilient to the climate, the impacts of climate change that are now unavoidable. What you can see on this slide in the call out at the bottom um, are some bits of the vision statement that we put together through earlier consultation on this plan. And those will be the guiding statements um, as we finish the development of the plan and move forward into implementation. Next slide, please. All right. So we have been working with ICLE Canada to develop this climate change impact adaptation plan uh, through their BARC, or Building Adaptive and Resilient Communities Framework. This is a five milestone plan that begins with stakeholder research and project planning um, at the outset and ends with monitoring and review of the plan after implementation. It's an iterative plan, uh, meaning that we will continue to revise and update it as time goes by and new information becomes available. Um, we're currently on milestone three. We're currently actually closer to the end of milestone three as we are getting close to having an implementation schedule and an action plan there. Um, and some recent deliverables have been the science of climate change report and the vulnerability and risk assessment that I will be talking about in a little bit. Next slide, please. All right. A little bit about engagement. So we used a lot of engagement to develop this plan, both internally and externally. Internally, we had a core project team that had representation from all city departments and that team met monthly. We also had six external mini workshops for the vulnerability and risk assessment, as well as internal and external surveys, workshops for developing and validating actions, one-on-one -on -one meetings were requested, um, the engaged site that Sue has already discussed. And as a result of this very intensive organization or engagement, we've had 26 social organizations, 13 industrial, commercial, and institutional organizations, and eight environmental organizations participate, creating a very full and complete plan that reflects um, the, all of the concerns that um, the community has, or so we hope. Anyways, next slide. So one of the reasons why we did this kind of engagement is because of equity concerns. Um, as I'm sure many of the folks on the call are aware, climate change does not affect everyone equally. While no one is immune to the impact of climate change and we will all be affected to some extent, some people, uh, depending on their, their place in society, will be more affected than others. So in order to... Um, deal with the, the equity side of these impacts, we conducted an extensive literature review looking for which demographic groups would be predominantly affected by climate change um, and did a stakeholder assessment of which organizations in the Hamilton community could best speak to the needs of those communities, of those demographic groups. We then had a very flexible and accommodating engagement strategy uh, recognizing that, you know, our community organizations have been as affected by climate change or more so, or sorry, by COVID as anybody else, um, and that resources, time, and staff availability are very strapped. So, um, you know, we, we had meetings anytime that they could be available and um, changed engagement where needed in order to accommodate them to the extent possible. Um, the photograph here was taken actually from the New York Times, and it shows um, the results of hurricane, a hurricane after it hit New York City last summer. It, the hurricane didn't actually, it was no longer a hurricane by the time it hit the city, uh, but it still caused extensive flooding, and that flooding led to the deaths of 11 people who drowned in their basement apartments. Um, the majority of the people, those people were undocumented immigrants who simply couldn't afford better or safer housing. Um, this is someone whose own home was flooded, but who managed to survive. And you can see um, the damage to the housing that he experienced as a result of that flood, as well as, you know, how high the water level got while he was inside. 
Um, now, of course, we're not a coastal city, so we're not expecting hurricanes and flooding to that extent, but we do see basement flooding in the city of Hamilton, as I'm sure many of you know, um, and it does affect it does affect um, low income families and residents more than others. Next slide, please. Okay, so we will now talk about uh, climate change impact statements. So ICLE began by looking at global and national climate change models based on several different emission scenarios to paint a picture of a full range of what could be possible for Hamilton's climate for the rest of the century. Um, looking at temperature, agricultural indices, precipitation, lake temperature and level, and extreme temperature. Um, and use this, this information to create over 70 climate change impact statements. An impact statement is a description of how a change to the climate will affect a person, a resident, a business, um, et cetera. So in the, in the case of flooding, if a change to the climate is that we're expecting to see more precipitation, then a climate change impact statement could be, again, about basement flooding. Next slide, please. These 70 plus corporate and climate community impact statements um, then underwent a vulnerability and risk assessment. Vulnerability is a, con a combination of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So if you have a basement, you're more sensitive to um, a basement flood, of course. And if you have flooding or insurance, or if, sorry, if you have savings or insurance, then your adaptive capacity would be higher in the event of a basement flood. Risk is a combination of likelihood and consequences. Likelihood is largely determined by the scientific models and consequences, again, depends on who you are. So if you have an empty, unfinished basement that nobody uses, then the impact, uh, the consequences of a basement flood for you would be very different than if you are a low income tenant of a basement apartment. That vulnerability and risk assessment for both internal and external stakeholders uh, resulted in 13 priority climate change impacts that were of most concern, both internally and externally. Next slide, please. Okay, and I will go through these fairly quickly. So flooding was one concern, of course. We have two impacts related to flooding, um, both due to increased frequency and increased intensity of, of precipitation events. Next slide, please. Extreme heat is next. It, extreme heat is the, the one impact that was mentioned by every community organization I spoke to. Um, it was certainly the most concerning impact for most of them. Um, and as a result, we have four climate impact statements that relate to extreme heat, reflecting both health and safety, direct health and safety impacts of extreme heat events, as well as economic impacts for, say, um, increased use of air conditioning during, during these events. Next slide. We had two other health and safety impact statements as well. One speaking to direct health and safety impacts again resulting from extreme weather events such as uh, ice storms leading to traffic accidents and one dealing with the increase in um, infectious and vector-borne diseases as a result of longer and warmer summers. Next slide. Water quality was also a concern. Um, as precipitation increases, runoff also increases and runoff from roads, um, parking lots, farm fields, and lawns tends to contain a lot of chemicals and these chemicals end up in our, in our water bodies. So that is a concern. Next slide. Erosion and infrastructure damage. Um, increases in precipitation can result in erosion um, for example, as we've seen along lake on the lake waterfront and on our escarpment leading to issues with um, escarpment access roads and that kind of infrastructure repair can be quite expensive. Power outages are also a concern. We have seen power outages resulting, for example, from ice storms in the past re relating to, to um, climate change. And some people who are more dependent on um, who are more dependent on consistent power supplies um, will be more affected than others. And next slide. Last but not least, food insecurity. Um, 
not just resulting from decreases in agricultural yields for local farms, although that is a concern, but also increases in the prices of imported foods as climate change affects the global regions where we import most of our foods from. Next slide. So um, we, with our internal and external stakeholders again, we looked at those impact statements as well as best practices from all kinds of adaptation plans throughout the country to look at over 130 adaptive actions that could be taken to protect people from those impacts. Um, those were then condensed. We looked for areas of overlap, um, repetition, and anything that the city had already prioritized through uh, an outstanding work item or budget we decided was already underway and we wouldn't worry about prioritizing it again. We ended up with 27 adaptive actions that were assigned to one of these four themes um, and 11 objectives under those themes. Built environment and systems, people and health, natural environment, agriculture and water, energy and, and economy. Next slide. Okay. So the action, the um, Action prioritization exercise resulted in three different levels of priority, priority one, two, and three. Priority one is short term, priority two is medium term, and priority three is long term. Um, they don't necessarily reflect um, importance, although urgency was certainly a consideration in developing the, the, the action prioritization. In some cases, it also affects or reflects things like um, how feasible it is to move on it quickly. Um, and and how many organizations in the community felt prepared to, to pitch it. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of the actions in a lot of detail. I will go through um, them in priority order and um, comment on anything that I think uh, deserves extra attention. So this slide shows our priority one actions. The first one, established buddy systems or help your neighbor programs to implement during extreme weather events was the one rated most urgent and important both internally and externally. So it is at the top of the list. Uh, but there's a number of other important actions here as well. Of course, we're looking at how we can change our residential buildings to be better equipped for climate impacts in the future. Uh, how we can make winter travel safer, um, especially for those who uh, primarily use sidewalks. Um, how we can communicate with the public about the risks associated with climate change and how we can better um, equip people to deal with extreme heat in the future and growing more food locally. Next slide. Now we're getting into our priority two or medium term actions. Um, Again, there's a number of actions here that relate directly to the kinds of equity impact or input that we received from our consultation. So looking at um, supporting vulnerable persons in the community and coping with climate change, for example, during evacuations, if there were some, how could we make sure that they're appropriately supported? Um, protecting them from climate impacts, including extreme cold and extreme heat, as well as linking climate adaptation to affordable housing more generally. Um, as I'm sure you can all imagine, someone without a house is more exposed to climate impacts of all kinds than someone indoors. So a first line climate adaptation action um, is making sure that everyone has a place to call home. This is obviously not something that's going to happen quickly, but we do want to make it a priority to move forward and, and make sure that those connections are strengthened over time. Uh, next slide. This is our second slide of medium term actions where we're looking at making sure everyone can access emergency preparedness kits, updating our municipal plans and policies, um, better protecting existing and new natural areas, um, both to protect biodiversity, to protect ground and surface water as we spoke to that being a priority climate impact. Um, as well as to absorb storms. Uh, when we get extreme precipitation, green areas do absorb that water better than, than hard areas for runoff. Um, and continuing to um, 
engage in tree planting. And this is one of the areas where the adaptation plan links up with the energy and emissions plan that Christine was talking about. Next slide. All right, these are the last of our medium term adaptation actions. Again, we're linking this up with the Community Energy and Emissions Plan through uh, the Urban Forest Strategy and developing and protecting our urban forest. We also want to look at food insecurity actions here by um, better supporting our local agricultural leaders in adapting to climate change um, and looking at ways to divert and repurpose um, excess food, as well as looking at the the resilience or, or the resilience of our local energy system and the grid um, to reduce the likelihood of power outages over time. Next slide. Now we're getting into our long-term actions where we are looking at um, updating our information about flooding risks throughout the city, um, looking at protecting people from vector-borne diseases, addressing excessive indoor temperatures and rental housing, and looking at how we can better manage our open space in the city. Um, this is one of those areas where you can have a little bit of tension in that we want to protect people from vectors, which tend to live more in naturalized areas, but we also need to have more naturalized spaces to improve um, resilience to things like floods. So we want to make sure that our, our plans and policies as a city balance that tension and both encourage the naturalized spaces we need as well as continuing to protect people from, from vector-borne diseases. Next slide. Um, here we're looking again at long-term actions where we want to um, monitor and notify people about flooding and extreme weather and temperature events um, and look at improving that. Look at low carbon backup power systems and city facilities to be community hubs during emergencies. And also look at whether or not we can uh, encourage and support the adoption of low or no carbon emergency energy supplies um, for residents and businesses, particularly those who, again, really depend on um, consistent energy supply. Develop low impact development and green infrastructure into new development and look at supporting our local businesses so that they can um, maintain their operations during climate events as well. And that brings me to the end of the adaptive actions. And I'm going to, oh, no, wait, is there one more slide, Trevor? I can't tell. My papers are stuck together. We're now at the live poll. Live poll yeah, Great, yeah. we're now at the live poll. Okay, Great. and Andrew, I'm gonna pass you. it back to Trevor because I can't see the screen. <laughs> thank you, Andrew, that was very clear. So again, we have a question for you. I'm wondering if we could put that full screen so we can all see it. Um, I'm gonna have to close my screen actually to get the question set up. So, so. keep it there for a moment then. Okay. So can you go back onto Menti if you can. And the code is here, 12009750. And for those who can't get into Menti, um, it says which two actions, recognizing there were lots there that are lots of important ideas, which two actions are you most likely to undertake in your own life in the next two years to help yourself or others adapt to a changing climate? So if you're able to put that into the Q&A, that would be great. So which two actions are you most likely to undertake in your own life? So let me just, uh, some patience and I'll get the question set up. Perfect, here. thank you. Oops. So I think um, people are saying that the old question is still there. Yeah, it should come, the new question should come up in just a minute. Yeah, there it should be there. Is it there? Yep, yep. there it is. There, yay! Thanks. Someone writes. Thank you for that. And now so I the have new to... question is there. And I have to share my screen. Again, there we go. Great.
So in the Q and a, someone writes that they would continue working with Hamilton 350 and elders for climate sanity. Um, another one writes expanding gardens to share with food banks would be one of their top 2 things that they would be doing in the next 2 years. And if I look, if I squint really closely, I'm seeing home retrofit. Food sump pump, I think it's got it's sort of collecting things together. Another writes another group was saying participate in community gardens or other urban agriculture. That's about 8%. 30% are saying help with community naturalization or tree planting. I see the numbers are fluctuating, so that's good as more people answer it. Joining in neighborhood support networking programs, about 28%. Uh, 4 percent so far saying volunteering in community housing projects. I'll just see what else is in the, the chat or the Q&A. Um, someone writes um, home retrofit. Another one says that they would potentially be replacing their furnace with a heat pump when furnace is done and also planting trees in the land that they tend and planting pollinator flowers and shrubs. Another one says plus one on heat pumps. Another says tree planting. So that's great. And we will share these as part of the feedback report as well, in terms of the, uh, the what people feel that they can themselves uh, really move forward on. Okay, I'll give uh, just I'll do a one other one minute countdown of people. Okay. They were given an option to do two to choose two of them. Okay. So if people they put one in and want to add another one in, go on, go ahead. Okay. And in the uh, Q and A, I've got hi. Alberto, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Hell, high Alberto colors for cars, roofs, etc. Alberto spelled A L B E D O. Albedo. Albedo. Another writes the amount of energy reflected by the surface is called albedo. Thank you. Dark colors have an albedo close to zero, meaning little or no energy is reflected. Pale colors have an albedo close to 100%, meaning nearly all the energy is reflected. Learning new things every day, which is very exciting. Uh, another writes that they would join and collaborate with community members to run mutual aid projects and help bring more environmental justice. Hoping to replace my gas furnace with a heat pump and other rights. So thank you everyone for those great contributions. Drive EV, continue to be child free or car free and continue to support environmental groups or three other ideas um, that have just come up. So I think voting is closed on this. Mm -hmm. So that is very great. And uh, I think at this point we were going to then go to a very final part of the presentation and thank you everyone for listening intently. I think Christine, if you're able to put your presentation back up. I am. So there are a few things around administration and governance in resourcing that uh, Christine was Oops. going to highlight for you. Sorry. That's okay. We are almost at the end of the presentation and then apologies we'll the everyone. Here we go. So Christine, I think you had a few things you wanted to share with us on this and then we'll be able to come to the other Q and A that are in the Q and A. Yeah, oh, it's just um, it wants to go right back to the beginning on here and I don't want that. So I may still have to do that. Okay, I do apologize to everyone for this. It's going to be annoying. Avert your eyes. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, we did want to take uh, a, an opportunity here to talk about gov administration and governance and resourcing. Um, for, and these actions have been developed and are currently sitting in the draft community energy and emissions plan, but they do apply equally to uh, the climate in in impact adaptation work too. So as we go through this, um, Please know that I'm speaking also for the adaptation work that Andrea is working on and um, and consider that work as part of, of these actions as well. 
So in order to ensure that both plans, the energy and emissions plan and the adaptation plan are actionized and implemented, um, we are recommending an administrative structure uh, for implementation of those plans. And the, in, the administrative structure includes the creation of a climate change office. So a climate change office is an office that would coordinate all things climate change related in the city um, including those implementations of the plans and monitoring and reporting on that. We're also recommending the creation of a, a multi-departmental climate change working group here at the city, um, which would have representatives from or resources from each department and will monitor and report on our city department's specific actions as, as they relate to each of the plans. Another element is the creation of a community-led climate advisory committee. So uh, a community-led climate advisory committee would be an independent body that reviews the city's climate progress and maintains accountability and increases transparency in the implementation of the plans. Um, they would also have a critical function in implementation of some of the community-based actions of the CEEP and um, coordinating actions similarly on the CIAP and monitoring those actions and reporting on those actions. So that advisory committee would report their, pro their progress uh, to the proposed climate change office and with that action and reporting would be incorporated along with the city's actions um, into an annual climate change report on, on greenhouse gas, gas reductions and progress on adaptation actions. And there would be key performance indicators that would be reported on through that. So that those are, um, the recommendations and ideas around the climate, the community advisory committee and the climate change office. With the community energy and emissions plan, and this can also apply specifically to adaptation actions, uh, we're looking at, um, in terms of resources, dedicated staffing for that climate change office um, and to lead this overall climate change action strategy implementation. Uh, within the city organization, we want to investigate the creation of a carbon accounting framework and a sustainable procurement policy, as well as the, the use of municipal green bonds. Um, we do have um, a, a long-term climate change reserve, but we need to find a sustainable um, source of funding for that here at the city. And our corporate energy uh, reserve, which exists already, could be expanded. And so we have an action for looking at that. So their uh, ongoing funding, of course, is also going to be needed to support the Community Climate Advisory Committee uh, as that committee moves forward. And, um, of course, that funding will depend on the nature of, of the committee as it's put together. And that's one of the tasks that we're working on right now at the request of Council to identify um, an appropriate format or structure um, for that, what that Community Climate Advisory Committee would look like. So that's all I wanted to mention on that. And we do have one more live poll. And I'm just going to, um, you can read that question. It's the yeah, same code. The you, can be, you don't need to re-enter your code, I don't think. But I'm right. going to have to stop sharing again. So, so I'll read the question quickly. Oops. Oh, sorry, Sue. Uh, that's but okay. I will get this up and running and we'll get, we'll hop to it. And it's the last question. And for those that can't um, access Menti, I think the question <laughs> related to what tools, approaches, or ideas did you have um, for the climate change office or for activities that could unfold that would make this really workable? Okay. Where's our, and there it is there. Great. So what tools, approaches, activities should a central climate office use to help us all implement the climate change strategy? So if you're able to take a minute and put in your ideas into the mentee, and if you're not, you can certainly put them into the Q&A and, and I will read them out. Got racial and economic diversity in committees, work closely with grassroots groups, solid public education outreach program to ensure Hamiltonians understand the climate energy and why we need to act, 
public outreach and engagement, ensuring that all actions outlined in the strategy have timelines. Working, um, we need to senior leadership responsible for all of this work with enough staff and budget to make it happen. We need very bold actions to convince residents that you are serious. Full department with a general manager that is part of the senior management team. Actively promoting and expanding urban and rural transit, probably fully electric. A massive, meaningful, useful public awareness campaign. Heavy community engagement through grassroots groups. The office should have senior level staff with strong influence over city staff. Need detailed milestones to track progress. Public outreach and engagement, we've got that. Heavy community engagement through grassroots groups. Climate lens seamlessly integrated into corporate decisions. The office should have senior level staff, again, that was noted. Actively promoting and expanding transit was noted. Ensuring that there is an arsenal, an arse, a, sorry, a senior bureaucrat as chair. Good support from industry and financial. Meeting regularly with department heads, detailed milestones. And I think the, the one at the bottom is creating new bylaws to increase industrial businesses, climate impacts, centering voices and people, and a systems approach and a well-funded team are all things that you've noted. Lots of uh, terrific uh, comments and ideas there. I'm just gonna check the Q&A to see what else um, may have come from others who weren't able to get into the mentee poll. So keeping the public informed, ensuring that there are appropriately qualified staff, having a strong, passionate director of the climate office, liaising with the school board for school presentations, having high level management and adequate skilled staff, remove Enbridge from the process and stop the support of RNGs, which is extremely, actually extremely energy. It may have been cut off there. Um, regularly meeting with department heads, as other uh, key ideas. So some, some really um, very helpful ideas put forward here with respect to tools, approaches, and activities. So thank you so much for that. Again, these will all be in, in, noted in the feedback report and will be able to be considered uh, by staff. And someone writes, be open to the community and do your best to avoid being defensive. Avoid being influenced by Enbridge who will want to Keep so-called renewable natural gas, which is still methane flowing through its pipelines. Keep positive and use this crisis as an opportunity to make our community more inclusive and caring than it has been. Challenge capitalism at its core root, hindrance to inclusion and equity. So thank you very much for that. I think the, the poll will close in just about a half, uh, about 30 seconds from now. Free public transit, major financial commitment to implementation, focus on climate justice, ensuring that youth are effectively engaged, facilitating their empowerment where climate action is concerned, looking at working through an environmental justice framework with grassroots groups, establishing clear targets, enough staff and funding to monitor, Maybe a regular two to three times a year progress report and community feedback opportunities with clear directions. Carrot and stick approaches. City councillors who work for the environment and are held accountable. Ensure that the community consultation includes um, BIPOC, people of, of color. Sufficient budget to get the job done. Yes, and the, the comment was cut off, so, so I apologize for that. Having natural liquefied gas is actually a very dangerous fossil fuel. Stop using it in HSR and new buildings. So the voting on the, so the amenity is, is closed. Um, I see remove Enbridge again, so that's clearly a topic of, of concern with many people here today. Creating new bylaws, bold actions, meeting regularly. So these are really helpful and constructive uh, references, so thank you very much for those. So, Christine, I think at this point, if, if we can, um, we will be able to put that into the feedback reports. We have that. If you want to go back to the slide presentation, you're doing a fabulous job going <laughs> opening screens, closing screens. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to share the screen and do the scroll again. That's okay. <laughs> 
So we're at the conclusion of the presentation and just wanted to then maybe go over again uh, for the Q&A, please, um, you are, which is terrific, put in any comments or questions you have into the Q&A. And if you can direct them to, to say not privately, but to, to send to all, that would be really great. And I'm going to start to go through those that we haven't already had a chance to, to read out and, and see if there's some clarification staff can provide. Christine, I think if you go slideshow, mm -hmm. the toolbar there, slideshow, and then from current slide. Nope. That's okay if you can. You can scroll. Oh, slide and we're fine. Ah. Uh, and then from current slide. Yeah, right, I hear you. Okay, there we are. Sorry about that, folks. There we go, that beautiful photo of mm -hmm. Hamilton. So let's go. hear from you. Please type your comments and questions into the Q and A area, and I'm noted we'll try to get to all of them. I know we we certainly want to make sure we have a chance to to hear the comments and have some discussion on them. I also have in my hand and I'm. A paper copy of questions that were posed before the meeting by individuals who wanted that question read out or that comment read out for the meeting. I'm going to start with one of those and then I will definitely go right to the Q and A. I'll go back and forth a bit. So the first one here says the 2050 end goal is important, but progress needs to be measured in shorter increments. I see that annual GHG reporting is part of the plan, but we need aggressive milestones and front loaded reductions to have the most benefit. Where are the shorter term targets to ensure we stay on track? Is that um, something for Christine or is that something for you, Trevor? I believe uh, I'll take that one and, and thank you, Sue, for reading that out. And thank you very much for that, uh, that question. So I, I did want to start off by confirming that previous to the climate change emergency declaration city council would have approved and and we do have an interim target uh at 2030 so it's 50% reduction by 2030 and pr uh prior to the climate emergency declaration it was 80% uh, by 2050 and now of course we we now know through global scientific community and consensus it needs to be net zero by 2050 so we do have that interim target of 50% reduction by 2030 based on our 2006 baseline. Uh, in the past, my team has been responsible and we do report annually on community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. So that provides an annual uh, greenhouse gas emissions profile broken down by sector. Uh, and so look, that's able to track our progress or lack thereof progress in terms of community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll finally say that as we develop these programs, and I'll use the building retrofit program as an example, we currently uh, have successfully gotten funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to develop that program. And we want to develop that program in a very transparent and open way, and we'll be we will be doing that uh, over the next uh, year. And when we develop that program, we will be looking at market readiness as well as market penetration estimates for building retrofits to then set informed targets and annual targets for building retrofits. So those annual targets very much are top of mind for us, as well as very important key performance indicators or metrics by that certain type of program, whether it be building retrofits, whether it be a, a citywide EV strategy, uh, those those metrics are very important to us, and we will be developing and reporting on those annually. Great. Thank you, Trevor. There was a comment that I'm going to read out, which was put earlier in the Q&A, which wouldn't have been from the same person, but I want to read the comment because it relates to this. My comment is that net zero by 2050 is too far away, a literal life sentence away. I truly believe it is not ambitious enough. It allows the city to kick that can down the road. Climate change is upon us now, and we must aggressively mitigate now. Hamilton in particular is so far behind as it allows industry to pollute at higher levels based on history with the steel industry at all the expense of its residents and the environment. So that was a comment that came in at 658. I just wanted to make sure I was able to read that out um, in, in, and perhaps hopefully provide some clarification in the, the answering of the question, but an important comment uh, to note. Someone writes here in the Q&A that they're excited to hear about the co-op neighborhood generation. We'll be very supportive of this. Are any panelists aware of places to start uh, for someone who is interested in creating one? That's at 659. Uh, sorry, Sue, it was a co-op neighborhood. Yeah, co-op neighborhood generation. 
So they were excited to hear that that was one of the actions that was noted in the plan. They're very supportive of it and they're just wondering if any of the panelists know of, of where they, how they would start that if they were looking to interest in creating one in their neighborhood. I can, I can take that 1 again, if you'd like, Christine, um, well, I mean, I am just curious. Is it uh, assuming they're meeting like energy generation? Yeah, yeah, renewable cooperatives okay. for energy generation mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I did see uh, down in the Q and a uh, another person typed in uh, relating to Nova Scotia clean foundation. Uh, so that's a, a good example of um, of a Nova Scotia cooperative program. So very interesting uh, information there. In terms of a local Ontario perspective, I would recommend uh, that you you research and look up Ontario Cooperative Association. And so that's an association that uh, um, has a board of directors as well as um, uh, other advice and strategies for any type of co-ops, uh, but uh, a very uh, a, a very important one um, and an interesting one is is renewable co-op energy generation. So there are a, some there are some existing uh, co-op energy companies or partnerships in Ontario, but it's very much our hope that we uh, we look at strategies and plans to incentivize, to encourage, and to in increase those energy uh, cooperatives. So uh, I would say Ontario Cooperative Association would be a, a good place to start. Great, thank you. So I've got I'm going to go, go through these fairly quickly because I want to make sure we get to is most, if not all. Um, a question here: Have most cities in North America developed climate action plans? To your knowledge, so I don't know whether you're able to comment on you're aware of lots you have. Um, Yes, we are aware of lots that have in terms of, of both adaptation and mitigation, but in ter uh, I, I can't say, I can't use the word most because uh, North America, we haven't done a survey all throughout, but it's, it's certainly um, a, a large issue in municipalities. I think it's fair to say that. And if they haven't developed plans, they're, they're probably talking about it and, and figuring out what they need to do as well. I don't think there's probably, there's probably no municipality that hasn't had a discussion on it. And, and I would agree with that, Christine, and I may direct that person uh, to look at the carbon disclosure project mm -hmm. or CDP. That's uh, from my understanding, 1 of the largest global. Uh, transparent, transparent and open data reporting platforms that uh, many municipalities around the world. And uh, I believe uh, in, in their website, they're, they're quoting uh, close to a thousand municipalities uh, around the world uh, report. And, and, and I would just agree with Christine that from my understanding, the majority, especially medium to large size municipalities have developed climate action plans. Mm -hmm. Great. Trevor, could and you just see what that was again? Just that was the. Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP. Carbon Disclosure Project, thank you. So we've got some more here. Have the recommendations included the following? Addition of bicycle lanes to all new road building or rebuilding. Education of citizens on how they can make adjustments in their own private spheres to reduce their carbon footprint. So two things. I think that came up when you were talking about the, uh, the plan um, earlier on. That would be for Christine, perhaps. Yeah, no, that was a, um, that was a good question. Thank you. And a good, it, or it was more, I guess it was more of a comment. Was it, was there a question in there? Sue? They wanted to make sure that the recommendations included that the additional bicycle lanes and also okay. education of citizens for adjustments in their own private spheres. So I guess those 2 areas were areas that they're interested in mm -hmm. and one to get a sense of whether the recommendations would include those 2 components. Okay. So education is, is definitely a part of, um, of. Of every every action in the plan, of course, and uh, that would be a, a certainly a, the role of of a climate change office uh, to to have a strong uh, public education component there. Um, there's many other other organizations providing education uh, to to the general public as well, in, in through their websites and their initiatives. So. Um, so that is is something that we do know is is definitely needed and and that needs to that information people need to have information in order to take action regarding the bicycle lanes the city does have a cycling master plan and that is being implemented um and it does have a plan for how cycling the cycling network should proceed now 
there are reasons why you can't have uh, cycle lanes um, on every street. Um, and part of it is just the nature of we have a very old city with some very old streets and and different functions of the street. But that plan does a good job in 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 balancing out the need to connect those lanes and and identifying the safest way to travel by bike. So I, you know, if, if it's a street, you can bicycle on it anywhere, um, but an actual protected bicycle lane is, is, is directed um, through that cycling master plan. But uh, tapping into the active transportation thing is, is a very important connector, uh, connector uh, piece and uh, plays a very strong function in the energy and emissions plan because it, it, gets people out of their cars. And that's what we want to see. We want those trips to be reduced. So um, I know our transportation planning group has approval for uh, many projects that just need to be um, need to be funded and resourced and built. And you can only have so much construction going on in a year. Uh, so uh, those those things are moving forward very, very well and, and very quickly, but there's always room for improvement to do more. Great. Thank you very much. So I see a comment here that's related to what you might have referenced uh, uh, in terms of your comments, Trevor. So regarding low carbon transformations um, on buildings, you mentioned the need to scale up. I understand that there are many solar cooperatives in other municipalities across the country, and they reference the clean foundation in Nova Scotia as one such cooperative that may be worth looking into. So that's clean foundation in Nova Scotia. Um, if there are such initiatives coming up from the community, in what ways will the city support this effort? Trevor, is that something that you or Andrea could reference in terms of um, how the city or whether the city would be supporting those efforts? Or is that something that is community driven with information? Yeah, thanks, Sue. Um, I can highlight, uh, so it, through the Home Energy Retrofit Opportunity, or HERO program, which Council did approve us to uh, acquire and, and, and go after funding, federal funding, to develop the program, we are currently looking at uh, not only different types of retrofits that would be administered through that 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 loan type of program. And then just to reaffirm, uh, a HERO program or a building, retro, uh, building retrofit program in its essence is meant to provide low or zero interest loans to building owners to retrofit their uh, to retrofit their building to improve energy efficiency and uh, uh, th there are many different retrofits that we're exploring we want to do a business case analysis on the different types of retrofits such as but but not uh, in uh, such as um uh, the air source heat pumps that I see many people mentioned in the Q&A as well, but as well as looking at uh, potential solar energy generation uh, and, and, and other renewable energy generation. There's also some links in our climate adaptation plan as well that we want to pay close attention to relating to uh, permeable pavers, um, rain gardens, rain barrels. Um, and so these, uh, these different uh, building retrofits uh, will be further uh, explored and analyzed uh, in great detail through the retrofit fit program design. Great. So it's a comment here supporting the need for stricter building codes for new builds. I know this came up in the presentation as something to be looked at for guidelines. So need for stricter building codes for new builds, both industrial and residential. This should have happened a long time ago. We know this was we know this was coming heat pumps for all houses and industrial buildings. So thank you for that comment and uh, the recognition how has to how important that is. Got another question here. Can anyone share an update on the status of the urban forest strategy? It seems to be missing in action at this point. Is there a timeline for completion? And it's important for the making growing green category reality. So it really needs to get moving in tandem with the rest of this work. And there was also someone else who said, when is the tree planting set to begin? So that may tie into the urban forestry. Could, mm -hmm. is it possible for one of you to comment on that question? Sure. Sure, I can comment. Um, uh, just a note about our action on tree planting in the 50,000 trees. Uh, where, what we envisioned for that as an action, it would be tree planting, not just by the city, but by all organizations that do participate in that. So it's any tree planting uh, by our conservation authorities, our other groups that uh, do tree planting programs. Um, 
and it's for tree planting both within our urban area as well as external in terms of supporting um, supporting our uh, forests and our natural areas where tree planting is enhancing those areas. So that's the 50,000 trees. Um, multiple people can implement that as well as people in their own backyards. Um, or front yards, you know, purchasing a tree or taking one that's uh, provided what by 1 of the organizations and and taking taking that action for their own properties uh, regarding the urban forest strategy. Uh, we are looking at, we do have a draft out that I think uh, maybe many people on this, this call would, or this, this uh, webinar would know about um, and uh, that that plan is in a draft stage and has has suffered a little bit just in terms of some resourcing issues and uh certainly uh uh yes just figuring out some of the details that were needed to move forward in terms of resourcing there as well so uh i don't have a very specific uh plan of action to present to you on that, um, but I can get back on an, an approximate date. It would, we were, I know that they were trying to bring something forward uh, before this, uh, in this term of council that may not happen. I know they've also been re-looking at some of, uh, of the data behind it and just making sure um, you know, that, that, that data and, and some of the sources um, are, are, are appropriate for moving forward on um, like uh, monitoring and then looking at uh, some other sources of data too that um, help to really frame out some of of both the uh, uh, tree canopy um, targets as well as um, some data on resourcing that we need to know too. Great, thank you, Christine. So I've got two questions in the in the in the Q and A here, and one that relates to it that I'm going to read to you all together. Um, might as well give you three questions at once. Ooh. So someone, as a comment here, suggests that biogas be dropped as an alternative fuel, um, referencing that the world needs crops such as food. So that's that's a comment, and we thank you for that. A person asks also any measures to encourage foster sustaining local agricultural productions. And then there was a question that was sent in in advance. How does the community energy and emissions plan link to Hamilton's 2018 food strategy? And I'm wondering if that's something that uh, Christine, you can respond to and don't yeah. want to forget about Andrea too. We know that you're still listening in and we can call upon you to, uh, to share some comments. So the link that CEP or the energy plan would have to the food strategy, and then if there's any measures to encourage or foster sustaining local agricultural productions. Right, so uh, the food strategy, Sue, for those on the, the call who aren't familiar with the food strategy, that was um, a document developed uh, around 2016, I think the person referenced 18, um, in that, that area of, of that time frame, um, and it provides us direction to, gu to guide decision making on how the city and the community can address food issues. So it's very broad in scope, it encompasses produ food production, processing, um, access, uh, food waste management, um, distribution, consumption, um, all those elements of food. Uh, generally, uh, the strategy does speak to access to food at both a neighborhood level and a regional level, um, or a citywide or regional, it used to be a region, so citywide level, um, as well as um, a focus on enhancing local food production. Uh, so supporting local food production and access reduces um, certainly the distance that food has to travel from a farm to a consumer. So that has an element of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and then if those distribution vehicles moving food in smaller distances are are then you know converted over to low or no emission vehicles, that's that's even better. So so an element of how long how far food has to travel to be to reach a consumer does have impacts on on greenhouse gases. Uh, so actions in the in the CEEP uh, really that support the decarbonization of of commercial fleets um, and and certainly uh, that supports uh, overall decarbonization would support the agricultural production uh, sector and then the local and local food production as well. Um, I guess similarly, access to local food is is critical um, uh, for a healthy population and connecting people to food. Um, food opportunities uh, really 
uh, is is important when it because it's in, when it's in close proximity uh, to people. I mean, people can access it better. So uh, our actions about uh, expanding local local transportation networks, active transportation and transit relate specifically to getting people that clo easier access to that local food. Um, Andrea, did you want to comment on that in terms of the adaptation piece for local food? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, one of our priority climate impacts is around food insecurity. And so, um, I think three or four of the adaptive actions speak to that priority impact. Um, we have actions on uh, community gardens, on urban farming and growing more local food, on um, making sure that they have good water sources to cope with changes in precipitation in the future, um, as well as working, um, establishing a community group to work with local agricultural leaders um, to determine what supports and information are already available at the provincial level and where local farmers feel that there may be gaps in, for them in adapting to climate change. Um, that one is, I, I don't think that one is necessarily mentioned in the food strategy, but the food strategy does do a lot of work around establishing things like community gardens and community kitchens that we think uh, provide some really great links for increasing food security. Um, in the local area and uh, we'll continue to explore those kinds of links and how we can how we can support people in obtaining good quality nutritious food um, despite climate impacts as time goes by. Great. Thank you very oh, much, Andrea. Sorry, and I also want to I just wanted to put in a little plug for the food strategy. They also have an engagement out right now too. Um, they're uh, taking the pulse on the community through an online survey that opened um, I think back uh, maybe a week or so ago, and it's open until July 22nd. So I do encourage you to take a look at the food strategy if you're interested and, and fill out the survey. Great, thank you. I've got a lot of questions here, so I'll try and go through them as quickly as possible. Um, someone makes a comment here regarding food production, saying that the current provincial government is encouraging urban development in the green belt, and are this, is the city taking any measures to ensure local agricultural land is not paved over? That's perhaps a, a challenging question, an important one. Maybe that's something we can note. Christine, if you want to maybe come back to that. No, I can just comment on that. The, okay. city, er, the city council did um, adopt a no urban boundary expansion um, uh, growth scenario back in January, I believe it was, and that's been, and that's, that's part of our what we call the municipal comprehensive review process, which is the process by which the city reviews its its growth, its its projections, and um, makes changes its plans to address that growth and meet and be and conform with the provincial policy. So that work has just been completed and um, or not completed. The first stage has been completed, and uh, that no urban boundary expansion. Uh, growth scenario was incorporated into the official plan through an amendment and approved by council. So that's now at the province for approval. So holding that boundary firm um, means there would be no more urban development outside of that current urban boundary. Okay, thank you. There's some questions, comments at the bottom with respect to the tree planting, and I've got some more questions to read out. So just, it just skipped on me, so I'm going to find it here. Um, it says. Regarding growing green, UN, the United Nations has draft targets for post-2020 biodiversity framework with clear restoration targets by 2030 and 2050. This is at 753. I believe one target is restoring 20% of the degraded freshwater systems by 2030. Um, why are these targets not discussed and could they be adopted at a local scale? That's at 753. I'm not certain if those targets are, are part of the urban forest strategy. I, we do have a biodiversity strategy in process. Um, they may be uh, referenced in there as well, but I would have to um, get that information and, and get back to, it, uh, back to the group to answer the question. We can put it in the Q&A area um, okay. for the follow-up. 
the other maybe thing? Maybe if it's okay, Sue, I'll just sure. quickly add, and, and maybe if Andrea wants to provide any specifics related to uh, water quality, better monitoring and studying uh, studies for uh, measuring flood and potential surface water uh, flow, which uh, has negative impacts for uh, freshwater bodies or, or nearby freshwater bodies. Um, there are other programs and other strategies that I think deal with that type of um, restoration. And so um, I'm just looking on the uh, Hamilton Clean Harbor program. So that program uh, is looking at remedi re remediating Hamilton's harbor. Um, and, and so I, I would uh, recommend that that individual uh, take a look at the Clean Harbor program and, and just uh, look at the types of projects. Um, and so those projects really relate to cleaning up the contaminated Hamilton Harbor, um, as well as I, I, I do know that the city being led by Hamilton Water uh, Division in Public Works is looking at creating a watershed action plan to help clean up and prevent contamination uh, to our Hamilton Harbor. Um, so there are there are other strategies either developed or being developed um, that look to restore and remediate uh, contaminated water uh, within Hamilton. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read a question here that I've got on from the pre done pre questions. Why is Enbridge even remotely involved and in fact a stakeholder in this plan? It seems obvious that Enbridge's involvement is the reason there is no plan for stopping fossil fuel hookups in new buildings in Hamilton. It seems to me that limiting and stopping the use of methane as soon as humanly possible is the obvious way to reduce our GHG emissions and anything less is simply skirting around the issue. And the person says, thank you. I do note there are also a few comments in the Q and A tonight indicating that concerns about Enbridge being involved in, uh, in terms of as a stakeholder. So I'm not sure who would be commenting on that. Is that Trevor, is that you or is that Christine or Andrea? I can, I can start and Trevor can add in if, if he likes, but um, on our stakeholder advisory committee, Enbridge uh, was participating and all the utilities were, were invited to participate as stakeholders. Uh, we do involve in utilities and we want to tap into uh, their expertise and knowledge with working with local energy solutions and, and uh, the utilities are moving towards having a more uh, community focus uh, um, uh, component to their operations and, and developing community focused um, Focus programs and working with municipalities on their local energy uh, uh, challenges. Um, certainly, they've worked on many community as stakeholders with many uh, community energy plans in prop in municipalities across the province. Uh, so. We do want to maintain good, uh, good partnerships with them and if they have uh, our. Our participants for some of our actions to uh, be working, working with them to realize some of those actions in the plan, then uh, we want to uh, continue to do that. So all our utilities are important stakeholders helping, helping us move forward on actions. Okay. Got a question that was in the uh, Q and a from tonight it says, does the plan phase out natural gas for new buildings as soon as possible? Um, the, as as soon as possible, uh, the actions in the plan are generally are are. I don't want to just call them near term actions because some of them are going to take quite a long time to implement. But they're the ones that we are initially getting started at. Um, in in the modeling, uh, uh, they the um. I'm going to actually I'm going to have to go back and look at at how the modeling proceeded and what they what what they did. What the, the consultants did with the natural gas component, um, unless Trevor, you have have recollection of that from the specific modeling. Yeah, and, and this kind of uh, just goes into a, a little comment too on the further of, of why we consulted and, and included uh, every local utility as well. Um, uh, the the low carbon scenario model is based on uh, best evidence. Um, consultation, best practices, uh, but mainly around the the data 
um, and, and looking at uh, the most recent up-to-date information to model the targets as well as to create the actions uh, within the community energy and emissions plan. And so the way the model uh, deals with building uh, the building sector is efficiency first. So we're looking at uh, retrofitting uh, almost all of our buildings across Hamilton. That will not only uh, reduce uh, fossil fuel use within those buildings, um, it will reduce the electrical consumption as well. Uh, and that's an extremely important part because then the next phase, um, and, and this is something that we don't want to wait on and, and, and something that I'm committed to working on the building retrofit program is funding for air source heat pumps. So the way the model is is uh, is in terms of, of priority, it's efficiency first looking at retrofits. Then it also then looks at mechanical switching. So getting off natural gas um, and other fossil fuel based for air source heat pumps in terms of electrical space heating. Great. Thank you for that. I'm going to switch, switch, switch a little bit here to a different topic. Um, someone writes, some renters in Hamilton are told by landlords that they're prohibited from using air conditioning. How can we ensure that these people are safe in times of extreme heat? Don't know if that's something that you could comment on. It's an important comment at 708. Can I ask Andrea, do you want to take that one? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so. I can't speak to um, the legality of landlords having requirements for whether or not residents use air conditioners during extreme heat events. Um, I'm aware that this is a very controversial subject and I've heard opinions on both sides that landlords can make those rules or they can't. Um, so I think anyone in that specific position might want to reach out to an organization like ACORN or um, if they can afford it, a lawyer to help them help guide them in that situation. What I can say is that for um, extreme heat in the city in the future, we are currently working on a pilot project with four city housing buildings downtown where we're looking at a variety of ways um, to support residents deal with extreme heat in the summer. Um, and some of the things that we're looking at trying this year are like in building cooling rooms, more shade outside um, and air conditioning for tenants and also helping to create like a, a networking circle so that residents can support each other as well during extreme heat events. Um, we also know that, you know, some, this is one of the areas where longer term retrofits are likely to be needed over time. Um, our infrastructure is really built to protect people from extreme cold because that was the risk historically in Canada. Uh, but we're expecting that, you know, by the 2080s, we'll be looking at 60 plus days of extreme heat in Hamilton a year. And that is very concerning for us. And I think the majority of the community organizations that I've spoken to, um, and we want to look at some of those longer term measures that can help to ensure that our housing is as safe in the summer as it's required to be in the winter. Not that that's a perfect system, but we have things like, you know, all new construction needs to have a furnace and you need to have a natural gas hookup and people can't disconnect your utilities in the winter and leave you without heat, um, those kinds of things. So we know that there's a variety of things that can be used to, to protect people from extreme heat in the summer. Um, air conditioning is one of them. So that's one of the options that, that's on the table that we'd be looking at as time goes by. Um, other things can be things like passive house retrofits. We've seen some of those in the city of Hamilton where Airflow, shade, and, and incoming solar radiation are all managed in such a way as to provide heat in the winter and cooling in the summer without needing a heating or cooling system or not much of one. So the energy required is very low, but the, it's very comfortable inside. Um, other kinds of retrofits can provide similar services without needing to, to install air conditioning. So we want to leave the door open to a variety of possible options, depending on what makes most sense for a particular site and a particular building. And um, we'll be developing those those plans and those guidelines as part of the adaptation plan over the coming years. It it won't be it's not a short term thing. It's a very big task, um, and hopefully we'll work in the short term or medium or long term with the hero program that's being developed. Great, 
Andrea, thank you. Go ahead, I'm going to group a couple of questions here because they relate to potentially the community advisory committee. Um, in fact, the climate office, one person writes, will the creation of the climate change office result in more hires and more time devoted towards this? So hold that question for a moment. And another writes, yes, for a community led committee, they see that important and that community members have a vested interest in mitigation and adaptation. Uh, big interest, big business are not so interested in having them participate in that they tend to have more of an interest in business as usual, and there may be no place for big business in this transition. And then there's a question that was preempted earlier that says um, here, what process will be used to create the Community Climate Advisory Committee to ensure that Black, Indigenous, people of color, the physically and mentally challenged, LGBTQIA and people and low income groups are represented. Is that something that Christine or yourself or Trevor, you'd be able to address? I can I can attempt the first uh, the crack at it. So the central climate office, yes, that is a proposed new office with FTE, uh, dedicated FTE, and that will be presented uh, to general issues committee on August 8th for approval. There is also, and we're looking at uh, research and best practices from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities on governance structures for accelerated decarbonization of medium to large municipalities. And so based on their recommendations, we are looking at not only that central climate office, but as well as embedding resourcing across every department uh, in the city of Hamilton. And so those embedded resources would form the adapted climate change task force um, because we 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 formed that multi uh, stakeholder or multi departmental task force, um, and and a lot of people did a, an extremely great job. But it was it was kind of a, a another thing on top of their very busy portfolio. So lessons learned there is we need dedicated FTE and resourcing in each department. So very much there are uh, additional FTE and resourcing being asked uh, to to council to approve. As for the Community Climate Advisory Committee, there will be a survey after this webinar that uh, as soon as the webinar is done, it will direct you to our Engage platform with a short survey about organizations and or individuals uh, that uh, you as the public feel should be on there. And, and we, we very much take that uh, very seriously. And we are currently in consultations with our urban indigenous strategy colleagues uh, around how to further support their objectives in the urban indigenous strategy as well as wanting to uh, consult our equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, the human rights division uh, for the city of Hamilton as well to ensure fair and equitable representation on those committees. Great, thank you, Trevor. Um, there was a question in, in the uh, Q&A that said, when will staff be requesting funds from council to hire new staff? I think you may have just addressed that in terms of that's going forward um, for the climate change office in, in August. Um, another writes, what's the most impactful thing a citizen can do to help encourage our governments towards taking climate seriously? It's a big question, big ask, but important. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think to encourage our governments, I think stay involved in actions. Um, uh, talk to your elected representatives, um, you know, participate in initiatives of community, community led and and city led um, and just continue to be engaged in the conversations and and where there's debate, be part of the debate um, and let your let your views be known. Thank you. So I'm going to keep keep going because there's a lot still more we want to get to in, in sort of our remaining 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so I want to make sure we try and capture as much as we can. Um, are there any plans to address the increasing emissions at the expanding Hamilton Airport? Um, okay. okay, you go ahead. Sure. Sorry, Christine. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have consulted with Hamilton Airport um, and interesting enough, they have hired a, a company called the Vantage Group and the, the director of environmental, social and governance used to be actually the lead climate change person for the city of Guelph. His name's Alex Chapman, an extremely intelligent individual that, that I respect. And so we were speaking with them uh, and so the Hamilton Airport 
does have uh, a full intent to develop an environmental, social and governance strategy. Uh, they haven't released any information yet. Um, I, I think it's, um, I don't want to assume anything in terms of their targets to decarbonize, uh, but part of that environmental uh, ESG certification that they're going towards will definitely include reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I also wanted to make a disclaimer that in terms of our net zero target, we know that there will be remaining emissions. And so therefore, uh, it, it's critically important that we increase uh, our natural environment, uh, our, our tree planting, our carbon sinks. And, and I, I did see some additional comments around the natural environment in there that I, I, I wanted to quickly address as well is, is yes, that's equally as important. Um, and so there will be a small, what we're calling a carbon gap um, that will need to be addressed either through renewable energy generation, uh, increased natural environment and, and tree planting, et cetera. Great, thank you. There's a comment I want to read out. It says, a well-funded climate department focused on this issue, led by a passionate, focused, well-informed, hardworking director of operations is key to the success of the plan, as is the importance of all city departments making decisions with an environmental lens and involving credible individuals and agencies in the city and beyond for advice and ideas. So thank you for that comment. Another rights, um, if we were to have another pandemic, um, and I shutter all of us uh, another COVID uh, situation comes on could we ensure that something at the level of, a, of an emergency climate office does not get reallocated to other services within the city I think the intent there is that the recognition that that this is a crisis and it's very important that that work continue through whatever else may come in terms of other situations that would evolve again thank you for that comment um, someone writes this is a comment how would the municipality prioritize spends between mitigation and adaptation interestingly I know you referenced that at the very beginning Trevor in terms of the difference between the two so mitigation is necessary but without immediate benefit Benefit. Adaptation is also necessary, but with the potential for immediate benefit. If my basement is flooding, for example, adaptation measures have an immediate impact, not decarbonization, even though both are absolutely necessary. So I think it's really recognizing the important push-pull of ensuring that both are, are prioritized and being able to, to move forward on actions um, with respect to that. Uh, another one writes, with respect to remote work, why is the determined action to concern education campaign on the benefits of work from home and remote work if this was a priority couldn't our economic development take on a climate green industry lens in recruiting new business Hamilton gave subsidies to Amazon recently if we can pay to incentivize a carbon focused business why can't we pay to for bring forward businesses that are less so so I get a comment that's important for for referencing some questions here about the um, and sorry, forgive me as I just scroll down quickly, try and make sure I can capture them all. A lot of them were good comments that came in through our discussion. Uh, I think you've answered this question. Why are there not specific annual targets for GHG emissions? I believe you addressed that. Um, certainly in your comments, Trevor, there was a question about where would the public go to, to see the annual posting of those targets, whether that be on the city's website or where would they be able to get that information in the future? Do you know where they might post that information? Yeah, I could, I could start with that. Um, so in the future, there is the intent to develop uh, a dashboard, a city, a climate change dashboard that breaks down greenhouse gas emissions by sector on a on an annual basis, uh, as well as I, I did I did reference the key performance indicators and those those annual targets that will be developed throughout uh, specific program design. Very much the intent is to make all of that very accessible and very transparent through a city dashboard. I will note as a whole, the city of Hamilton is undergoing uh, a revamp on its on its uh, city's website, and we are in talks with our IT department uh, around developing that dashboard. Okay, thank you. There was a question earlier on about why um, our d current development applications being allowed to cut down trees. I'm paraphrasing. It was a longer a longer comment, but the concern that that while development is on is on unfolding right now, trees are being cut down and and some concerns obviously about why and how that is happening and how that's being addressed. 
And uh, then a question with respect to whether climate change development guidelines can be incorporated in developments that are occurring right now. Um, lots of uh, new builds are happening in the city, um, some sort of apartment towers, for example, and whether those climate change pieces can be factored into the building design. I don't know if Christine, there's a possibility of a comment on the city efforts in that respect. Okay, so first, um regarding the trees. So in the development approval process, tree protection plans are, are often um, required uh, in based on in, in the context of what's existing on a site. So um, that, uh, that is taken into consideration um, and an applicant would, would develop that. And, and sometimes the straps, there's different, I can't speak to, a, a, any specific case, but um, often there's ways of, of of addressing tree removal by replanting elsewhere on site, um, and that certainly is uh, the case in in elements of development that are adjacent to um, some of the more um, I don't want to say just the natural areas, but areas that are more close proximity to some of our natural our natural spaces, but that's um, that's managed through the development process and, and there's there's probably many factors in, involved in, in, in those situations. What was the other question? So the question related to the importance of having climate change impact development standards in buildings that are going up mm -hmm. now so okay. that they can, and I think it's reference that that would come in terms of new standards, right. but the sense of if, can any of that be done now as those buildings are going up? Well, we do have uh, um, the process underway to develop those uh, green building standards, and those are components of uh, certainly the site plan guidelines, but also some other standalone things specific to buildings. Um, uh, so those are not developed yet. Um, generally, uh, some of the more specifics in terms of 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 energy efficiencies, those are are guided or 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 mandated to a certain level by the building code um, but that doesn't mean you can't exceed a building code so uh, there those we don't the building the building code um, is enforced by our building division and so but the development app, app approval process is through our planning division um, so development applications uh, uh, come in, um, get approved, and then they go off to building permit process. So, um, uh, at the development side, uh, we we are limited in terms of of what we can what we can require. Um, and the whole point of doing green development standards is is identifying the suite of things that that we want to either um, we either require or at least incentivize to some degree. So um, that's where we're at on on that. But okay. the, the building code elements, um, I know building codes are being uh, reviewed and they're actually they're in a review right now. And I believe some uh, new work, new coding is coming out in the fall um, that, that promises to have additional um, energy standards and, and uh, sustainability standards built into that, but um, uh, that's still to be seen. Great, thank you. Someone writes that with respect to building energy codes, that there's no need to reinvent the world through mm -hmm. the wheel, adopt the Toronto Green Standard or the BC British Columbia step a code, which both um, both offer builders time to adapt. So some good examples mm -hmm. that I'm sure reflected. Um, I've got a question that was posed around what plans does the city have to require permeable paving for new builds in particular large retail spaces? Um, and is there a stormwater tax under consideration for the second part of that? I don't know if that's part of what the work mm -hmm. that you're referencing, Christine. It is. Um, so. At, at, and this was a question that had been submitted earlier, so I did take a look at that earlier. So at the site plan level, at the site level, which uh, the question is asking about, we do have site plan design guidelines um, that guide what happens on the element of a site and um, in and the, that's reviewed during the site plan approval process. Uh, there is an update to the site plan guidelines going on right now. So they they would likely be considering permeable pavement applications as as one of probably many different elements um, that may relate to um, 
uh, improving infiltration down um, on a site. So that is work that's ongoing. Um, However, if the goal is to reduce a stormwater runoff, um, there's there's likely there is likely a variety of ways to do that, um, and that would be considered uh, during the, the the site plan guideline update. Um, in terms of the stormwater tax, I don't have details on that, okay. but um, we could look into that and provide um, in the Q and A report. We can add that in. Um, so, someone writes, will all members of the advisory committee be volunteers? Would be chaired by 1 of them or by a member of city or staff? And I think that's Trevor, you're referencing the survey that comes out afterwards. That's where they'd love to you'd love to hear your ideas. So, in terms of what you think would, would really make it work. So, please take the opportunity if you can. Another writes just a comment. The city of Burlington requires a permit to cut private trees greater than 20 centimeters in diameter. Hamilton has no such requirement. So, keeping older trees as much as possible would seem critical to the urban canopy plans. So thank you for your comment. Another right. Sorry, I have to leave the meeting, but I just want to say thank you for your time and effort as we keep moving this urgent issue forward. Another right just a comment that it'd be great if the city started now to incorporate climate initiatives in all other departments. So that a separate climate office is not necessary. When that happens, we, we will be on the right track. And I believe both of you in your presentation said there were a number of initiatives. I know Andrea did in fact reference mm -hmm. already on, on go under underway um, that, that you weren't highlighting those. You were highlighting that the things that needed still to be happening. So maybe that's uh, just important for the comment. Is it okay if I make a quick comment there? Sue, Absolutely. Too? I just wanted to highlight, I, I, I tried to mention at the, the beginning in terms of the context slide to, um, and just to address one of the comments relating to the redeployment of our climate change staff, including myself in in uh, 20, 2020, time time means nothing in, in COVID years. Um, but uh, but what, I, what I just wanted to highlight is the, the importance of that foundational report through the corporate goals and areas of focus that directed every department to start taking action on climate change. So that report was completed in December of 2019. And then that directed folks in public works, for example, the fleet um, who before wasn't working on climate change was working on a green uh, fleet strategy, which has now been approved and looking to convert 89 vehicles. So, so that happened while my team and, and, and myself were redeployed. So just because their staff isn't called, a, it doesn't have climate change or climate in their, in their uh, position title, doesn't necessarily mean they're not working on climate change or that their work is not meaningfully uh, addressing some of the climate change issues that we're talking about here today. Um, and yeah, just wanted to highlight too quickly. Um, I'm very interested to hear any examples of uh, other advisory committees where uh, monetary or other compensation is provided to uh, individuals or volunteers, because especially if we want to get uh, some of the uh, equity or historically marginalized uh, populations and groups on this advisory committee, I do think it's important uh, that we provide some sort of comp compensation for their time and their effort. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to read everyone's feedback on that. Great, thank you. So we've got one further comment to read out, and then I think we'll do is take uh, have you Trevor go to the quick next steps, and then we'll be able to conclude tonight. Uh, someone just wrote, and I think it's important just to reference this: that um, any potential new stormwater fee is being considered by staff with the hiring of a consultant, which was recently approved by Public Works Committee, and the guiding principles consultation will be happening in December. So that's a further to what you had indicated, uh, Christine. So that's great. That's great. Have that information. So uh, there are. Probably what 10 or so comments or questions we weren't able to get to. I apologize for that. We'll make sure that they are in the feedback report and a response will be provided to those in that feedback report so that you would be able to go on and see that and have your response noted. I know Trevor has indicated that the survey will be coming out to you and that's something if you can respond to in the next couple of days. We know it's Canada Day weekend coming up or into early next week, with, particularly with respect to ideas about the advisory committee and the climate change office. And and then we'll continue on. So Trevor, I think the next two slides, we're very quickly giving just some next steps and then we'll be able to close out the evening. 
Yes, thank you very much, Sue. And thank you everyone for tuning in uh, this evening to talk about this uh, extremely important uh, strategy. And so, as we mentioned, we are bringing the Community Energy and Emissions Plan, as well as the Climate Change Impact Adaptation Plan forward together uh, to ensure that there's proper implementation and resourcing to achieve the actions of both plans. And so we did uh, submit the, the, the draft uh, Community Energy and Emissions Plan and an update uh, on the Climate Impact Adaptation Plan to our General Issues Committee, which uh, did receive unanimous approval to go out for final public consultation, and which is what we're achieving uh, right now, as well as many other internal and external consultations that we've had uh, with many organizations across the community and individuals across the community. We're compiling all of this information and the internal city implementation and resource development uh, currently right now as well. Uh, we are in very close discussions with our senior leadership team, which is the general managers of each department to figure out what excuse me, to figure out um, what that office and where that office will be located. And we wanna bring all of that forward to the General Issues Committee for August 8th. Uh, and, uh, and and so we, 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 we greatly appreciate any additional support. Um, any, any uh, I, I strongly encourage any delegations uh, that feel strongly uh, will need all of the, the support that we can get uh, in terms of uh, getting that approved. I do feel confident that it will be approved, uh, but that will ultimately be council's decision. And in terms of of, uh, and an impactful uh, thing that individuals can do, go talk to your councillors um, or other elected officials um, around the need for accelerated climate change action. I think that's extremely imp uh, important. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Uh, after this event, I believe the WebEx event will send you directly to the Engage platform or the survey. Just in case it doesn't work, I'm going to uh, plop in the uh, the link into the Q&A as well. Uh, oh, shoot, I don't see it. We wouldn't be able to see that, so. Um, yeah, I can't do that, unfortunately. If you could just, um, if that's something that you could um, put on, I guess you can't put on a slide, can you? No, that's uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm fairly confident um, if uh, I'm, the WebEx will, uh, will automatically divert you to that survey. If it doesn't, please feel free to, to email myself um, or, or Christine or Andrea. Um, I can also follow up uh, with a direct email to everyone uh, with, the, with the survey link as well. Great, so thank you very much, uh, Trevor, Christine, um, Andrea, and everyone else. And we know Melanie's assisting on technical stuff here. Thank you very much. At this point, you could just click the red button and hang up on us. Unlike having additional conversations in a meeting room, you can hang up on us. So again, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the feedback on the survey. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.